On the 8th of August 2023, the Waterloo and City Line will be 125 years old. The Waterloo and City Line, sometimes called the Drain, is unique. It's the shortest line at 1.47 miles. It has just two stations, Waterloo and Bank. It's the only tube line to be completely underground. And despite being a century and a quarter old, it's only officially been an underground line since 1994. So you see what I mean when I say it's unusual. Let's take a deep dive into the history of the drain. In 1848, the London and South Western Railway opened their new London terminus, which at the time was called Waterloo Bridge. Their engineer was Robert Stevenson, one of the men behind the locomotive rocket and a strong contender for the greatest railway engineer in the world at the time. Stevenson advised them that this was a pretty good place to leave it, they were opposite the West End, land was cheap, and there was room for expansion. But the London and South Western had other ideas. They wanted to get to the city proper, i.e. the financial district. Waterloo would be an intermediate stop before they reached their intended ultimate destination. The idea they proposed, before Waterloo had even been fully built, was to extend east to a station at London Bridge. Not the London Bridge station that already existed, and indeed still does, but a new one next to it. Let's just say that holistic planning was not a hallmark of early railways. They couldn't raise the money for it. It seems that the investors were of the same opinion as Stevenson. In 1849, a royal commission decreed that no new surface railways could be built in central London. Or at least, they wouldn't make it easy. While the London and South Western tried to get the capital to get further into the capital, they ran horse buses into the city. Traffic at Waterloo increased, and despite their wishes, Waterloo became the de facto final stop on the LSWR. They added new platforms as and when required, resulting in a sprawling and illogical mess of a station. For commuters in the late 19th century, the real battle of Waterloo was figuring out where to find your train. A railway from Waterloo to London Bridge would get built, but in the opposite direction. London Bridge Station, the one that already existed, was owned by the South Eastern Railway. Their market research, or whatever the 19th century equivalent was, told them that commuters wanted to get to Waterloo. So a new company was formed, the London Bridge and Charing Cross Railway. In theory, this was an independent company, but in practice, it was mostly owned by the South Eastern. In 1864, the line opened. At the insistence of the London and South Western, there was a branch connecting with their station, and that's what this now disused bridge was for. And yes, that does mean that there was a line running straight through the concourse of Waterloo. But the situation wasn't good. The relationship with the South Eastern was rocky, and the LSWR didn't like the fact that the South Eastern could lock them out at any time, which they did more than once. In 1867, the South Eastern closed the connection for good, so it was back to the proverbial drawing board. In 1881, a new proposal was put forward by an independent group called the Waterloo and City Railway. This would have been a conventional above-ground railway from Waterloo to Queen Street, but it would have been expensive, requiring the demolition of some very pricey buildings and a new bridge over the river, and the LSWR weren't interested. The following year, the LSWR tried to get in with the South Eastern again, to get onto that company's line from Charing Cross to Cannon Street. Again, no dice. In 1891, a railway called the Royal Exchange and Waterloo was proposed, which would have been an above-ground railway from Waterloo to King William Street, to compete with the South Eastern. It was dropped quite early on. But also in 1891, another railway was proposed. A railway under the ground. An underground railway, if you like. In 1890, a new railway had opened that changed everything. This was the City and South London Railway. It was an electrically powered railway constructed deep below the streets of London, running from Stockwell in South London to King William Street in the city. The first true tube line. 
This line didn't require expensive land acquisition and demolition, nor did it violate the terms of the Royal Commission. It was a success, both financially and in engineering terms, and opened up a whole lot of new possibilities. It triggered a tube mania, with seemingly endless new proposals for underground lines being submitted almost immediately. In 1891, among other proposals, the lines that would become the Piccadilly, Bakerloo and Northern Lines were submitted to Parliament. So, too, was a line from Waterloo to the city. This would have run from just off James Street in Lambeth to Mansion House. It would have been either cable-hauled or powered by the newfangled electricity. The proposal was independent of the LSWR, but they endorsed it. The proponents were also, for the most part, the same people pushing the Baker Street and Waterloo Railway, better known today as the Bakerloo Line. In fact, the intention ultimately was that the two railways would connect, though in the end they would take different courses and would be unable to easily link. The engineer in charge of this Waterloo and City proposal was James Henry Greathead, who was to underground railways what Robert Stevenson had been to conventional railways. There was a lot to discuss. While a tube railway was a lot more practical than a surface railway, there were still engineering challenges to be overcome, landowners to placate, authorities to be mollified. The London County Council were particularly difficult, demanding unnecessary alterations to the plan. But after a lot of wrangling, on the 27th of July, 1893, the Waterloo and City Act was passed. And so the Waterloo and City Railway officially existed, as a legal entity at least. In theory, the company was independent, but in practice, four out of the five directors were also with the LSWR, and three were with the Bakerloo. Also, one was with the Taff Vale Railway in Wales for some reason. The LSWR would effectively run the new railway in exchange for a percentage of the income. To all intents and purposes, this would be their extension into the city. So work began with some test bores. Construction proper started in 1894. Digging was carried out using four Greathead shields. And no, that's not a coincidence. James Henry Greathead had designed the shield, based on one invented by Mark Isambard Brunel and used to dig the Thames Tunnel, which is now part of the overground. Greathead's shield was circular, and had been successfully used to build both the Tower Subway and the City and South London Railway. Hydraulic rams forced it through the clay. As the workmen dug, they reinforced the tunnel behind them with cast iron rings. It was a good day when they advanced ten feet. Incidentally, one of the tunnelling shields is still down there. It's in the passage between the Waterloo and City Line and the Docklands Light Railway. It wasn't just engineering challenges that slowed progress. There were further legal challenges that had to be taken care of up on the surface. In 1895, work was stopped by the weather. The river froze over and the barge that held the air pumps couldn't get close enough to the ventilation shaft. However, by the middle of the year, the tunnels were complete enough that the company could give tours of the workings. One notable guest was the King of Belgium. Greathead would not live to see the completion of the line passing away in 1896 and being replaced by Alexander Kennedy. The map of the route here is interesting because it's different from the one we actually got. In those early days, tube lines tended to follow the route of the streets above, for two reasons. Firstly, because they had to pay easement fees for buildings they passed under. And secondly, because no one was sure if the trains would vibrate the buildings to pieces. On this map, the line follows the streets, but when the actual line was built, it only did that north of the river. That's because south of the river was a much poorer part of town. So, if a building did get shaken up, there were less likely to be severe consequences. At least, for the railway's directors. The tunnel under the river dips quite sharply. This was so that gravity could do some of the work getting the train down there, and its momentum could give it a boost on the other side. The company would come to regret this when it came to actually working the line, but more on that later. Initially there were to be two stations, one at Waterloo and one at the city. The city station would connect to the Central London Railway's bank station. They also considered the possibility of a third station at Blackfriars Bridge, but that never happened. Waterloo Station is built on top of a set of vaults, and the tube station was to be built in here, 
effectively in the station's basement. This meant that, among other things, the staff canteen had to be moved. The Waterloo and City Railway would also have its offices in Waterloo Station and its depot down below. This being the 1890s, there was no national grid and so the line had to generate its own power. The power plant was here in this building and was supplied with coal by the LSWR. That square thing in the middle of the building is the base of the chimney. The station at Bank had less by way of infrastructure to think about, but nevertheless it had complexities of its own. It was to be connected to the Central London Railway station, the idea being that they wouldn't take up so much expensive space above ground if they only had the one station. The passages connecting the two were owned by the Central London, and the Waterloo and City paid rent and for some of the electricity used. Now, I call it Bank, but it was officially known as City, at least on the Waterloo and City section. The CLR still called it Bank. This resulted in a weird situation where employees of the Waterloo and City referred to the whole thing as City and the CLR's staff called everything Bank. And God help you if you were a tourist. Track was of the same type as the LSWR used, logically enough. Electrical equipment was supplied by Siemens, who were probably the company with the most experience in electric railways. Although, in the 1890s there wasn't much of a pool to choose from. Siemens also supplied this shunting locomotive. Trains were to pick up power from a conductor rail and return it using the running rails. A three-rail system. The trains were supplied by Jackson and Sharp in America. Traction equipment made by Siemens in Germany and the whole shebang assembled by the LSWR at their works at Eastleigh. Other underground railways had used a locomotive hauling carriages, but the Waterloo and City specified multiple units, where the motors were built into the coaches. The two end coaches would be motorised, with the two in the middle being unpowered. This would save time and space shunting at each end of the line. To get the trains down there, a hydraulic lift was built at Waterloo, connecting the main line sidings with the tube tunnels. This was in place until that side of the station was rebuilt to take channel tunnel trains, but more on that later. Works were completed in July 1898, and on the 11th of that month the official opening took place, with a ceremony and feast attended by the Duke of Cambridge and representatives of the press. The intention was to open to the public on the 1st of August, but in the event this got pushed back to the 8th. And so, at last, it was possible to get directly from Waterloo to the City of London via the London and South Western Railway. Well, sort of. The line proved popular from the off, so much so that it actually ran into technical difficulties caused by its popularity. On one occasion a train was so overloaded that it couldn't move. On another the train was so heavy that the springs couldn't cope. The carriage was pressed down against the rails causing a short circuit. But the Waterloo and City has, and always has had, weird traffic patterns. During morning rush hour you have thousands of people crowding the trains from Waterloo to Bank and hardly anyone going the other way. Then during the evening rush hour the opposite, and in between very few passengers indeed. For this reason trains were operated wastefully. They had to be powerful enough for rush hour traffic, but all that power was unnecessary the rest of the time. So in 1900, five new trains were ordered for off-peak travel. Well, I say trains, but they were single-car units with a cab at each end. In 1901, they bought another shunting engine, but this was transferred to the LSWR's power station at Wimbledon 15 years later. In 1899, the LSWR made plans to completely rebuild Waterloo Station to make it, you know, logical. It would take over 20 years, but the work would be completed in 1922. That is, substantially, the station we have today. Fortunately, as part of the Act of Parliament authorising it, the Waterloo and City station was protected. In 1906, negotiations began for a takeover. The relationship between the LSWR and the Waterloo and City was weird. For instance, not long after the tube line had opened, there had been a situation where the LSWR wanted to expand Waterloo Station over land owned by the Waterloo and City Railway. So they found themselves basically in legal dispute with themselves. The matter was eventually resolved amicably between the London and South Western Railway's directors and themselves. But to return to 1906, an official takeover could be advantageous to both companies. 
The Waterloo and City would be under the protection of a much larger company, and the LSWR would have control of the entire route into the city. By 1907, the takeover was fully complete. That being said, the line would be depicted on maps as either the Waterloo and City Railway or the Waterloo and City Line all the way up to, well, now. One effect of the takeover was that from 1915, additional power would be generated by the LSWR's power station. That one that was at Wimbledon, which you may recall I mentioned a short while ago. The LSWR was afraid of being shown up by the underground lines running into London, and so they embarked on a program of electrification on their suburban lines. In 1923, the LSWR, and of course the Waterloo and City with it, was taken over by the Southern Railway. In 1933, all the underground lines in London were taken over by the London Passenger Transport Board, better known as London Transport. All that is, except the Waterloo and City, which was considered a branch of the Southern Railway, and therefore nobody's business but theirs. Despite that, London Transport, perhaps overwhelmed with excitement, came up with a few ideas that would have affected the Waterloo and City. They proposed, again, a station at Blackfriars that would provide interchange with the district line. They proposed extending the Great Northern and City line from Moorgate and building a station at Queen Street that would interchange with the Waterloo and City. And another at Watling Street that would have a corridor connection to Bank. As if Bank Station wasn't complicated enough already. They suggested as an alternative that they might connect the Great Northern and City directly to the Waterloo and City, presumably creating the Great Northern and Waterloo and City and City line. They proposed extending the Waterloo and City line to connect with the East London line. They even proposed extending to Liverpool Street, then running trains over the main line to Chingford and or Walthamstow. Fortunately or not, none of these plans went ahead. The Great Northern and City connection was considered to be too challenging in engineering terms, the East London connection wasn't considered worth it financially, and in general, the Central Line was likely to get in the way of any extension at City Station, physically if not also legally. By the late 1930s, everything was looking a little long in the tooth. The line had sharp curves and steep gradients, and of course that problem of uneven working, all of which put a strain on the trains. I'm a poet and I'm fully aware of the fact. The ride was bumpy and noisy and just very old-fashioned all in all. The trouble was so acute that questions were even asked in Parliament. On the 27th of November 1937, a plan was issued for full modernisation. The mechanical signals were to be replaced by electrical ones. The track was to be fully welded to reduce bumps. The live rail would be moved from between the running rails to outside them the same as on the rest of the Southern Railway. And new trains would be ordered. The Second World War put paid to a lot of underground plans, but fortunately there was an exemption if works were already progressed far enough. The works on the Waterloo and City were indeed progressed far enough. In 1940 the new trains arrived. They were built by English Electric and were heavily influenced by what was happening on London Transport's deep level tube lines at the time. The carriages were longer, roomier and had a distinctly Art Deco look to them. To solve the problem of low demand outside rush hour, the motor coaches had cabs at each end and could operate independently of the rest of the train. So single car services would still be a thing. A less dramatic effect of modernisation took place on the 28th of October 1940, when City Station was finally renamed Bank, in line with the rest of it. Well, apart from the bits that were Monument, but you know that whole Bank Monument thing. Even though the modernisation programme was proceeding as planned, it was hardly business as usual for the line. On four occasions the line was affected by bombing. On the 12th of September 1940, a delayed action bomb was spotted on the tracks, but safely diffused. How it got down there remains a mystery. On the 20th of October, debris from a nearby hit buried a couple of the sidings in the depot. On the 8th of December, a much larger bomb landed outside of Waterloo Station, opposite the Victory Arch, and blasted a hole in the roof of the line. Damaged water mains flooded the station. On the 15th of October, the line was indirectly affected when Dernsford Road Power Station in Wimbledon was bombed, cutting off the juice. Repairs in every case were slow due to labour shortages, 
Yet the war also brought the first and only period of the line operating on Sundays. Historically, it never had. There were few enough passengers on a weekday outside of rush hour. Running trains on a Sunday seemed pointless. Yet from 1943 to 1947, trains operated for the benefit of servicemen on Sundays, as well as Good Friday and Christmas Day. In 1948, the railways were nationalised, and so the Southern Railway became part of British Railways. On the 13th of April that year, an extremely hair-raising accident occurred involving the carriage lift. A locomotive very much like this one was shunting wagons onto the lift to be taken down to the depot. Unfortunately, the end of the lift had not been properly secured, and it began to sink at an angle. This pulled the wagons down, and they in turn pulled the engine in after them. Incredibly, no one was injured. The engine crew had jumped off, and the other workers happened to be out of the way when the accident happened. The line found itself more heavily used than usual in 1951, when the Festival of Britain was held on the South Bank. Despite the popularity of the festival, British Railways decided a Sunday service on the Waterloo and City would not be merited. The change in traffic patterns caused by this, though, had highlighted a growing problem at Bank. To get between the Waterloo and City platforms and the rest of the station, the only way was a long, sloping corridor broken up by sets of steps. For decades it had been a source of complaints, one of the most embarrassing being that the journey between trains could be longer than the journey between Waterloo and Bank. On several occasions management had considered installing escalators, but for one reason or another it had never worked out. During the festival period, station staff were faced with the unusual experience of crowds going in opposite directions at the same time, causing dangerous levels of congestion. In 1955, British Railways announced that escalators would finally, finally be installed. But they weren't. The works would be expensive and require a massive amount of reconstruction with the associated legal issues. But in 1957, they started playing with a new idea, an invention called the Travolator. This was a fancy way of saying moving walkway and it could be installed in a new passage alongside the existing one. In 1960, at last, the Travelators opened. In 1969, the little shunter at Waterloo Depot was retired and can now be seen at Locomotion in Shildon. Thoughts turned to the rest of the rolling stock, which wasn't quite so elderly, but was nevertheless getting up there in years. During the 70s and 80s, the trains were overhauled, or, in some unfortunate cases, scrapped. In 1986, a new initiative was launched, known as Network Southeast. Under British Railways, or British Rail as it was now known, the commuter railways in London and the South East had become rather run down, and nowhere was this more evident than on the Waterloo and City Line. It was shabby and dingy, even with such upgrades and overhauls as had been carried out since the war. Network South East was a new sector of British Rail that would take charge of all these lines and, to oversimplify, spruce them up. Commuting into London was on the rise, and it was expected that the regeneration of Docklands and the arrival of its new light rail system would put a strain on the drain if something wasn't done. As well as general improvements, some more radical ideas were suggested. Once again, consideration was given to the idea of a third station at Blackfriars. The Thameslink project was well underway, and Blackfriars would be one of the stops on this revitalised line. More radical still was the idea of turning the whole line into a light rail system, or even a maglev. The most bonkers concept was to replace the whole line with a travelator, although that one wasn't under consideration for long. In the end, though, Network South East decided to keep the line as a tube railway but they would buy new trains. In the late 80s, a new kind of train was in development for the Central Line. These would become known as the 1992 stock. The carriages were longer than the 1940 trains, but they would still fit, only just. It was simpler and cheaper than developing a whole new kind of train. So these new trains, known as Class 482s, were delivered in 1993. Actually, they were diverted from the Central Line's order. I don't know what London Transport thought of that. One downside of the new trains was that being longer than the old ones, they could no longer use the lift. From now on, trains going for maintenance would have to be lifted out of the depot by a crane, 
which was just as well because Waterloo had been chosen as the terminus of Eurostar trains, and the new international station would obliterate the old sidings where the lift was located. Then in 2007, St Pancras became the international terminus, but that's another story. With the new trains came an overhaul of the entire line. The Class 482s, being proper underground trains, operated using the same four-rail system as other tube lines. And so the line had to have new conductor rails laid. New signalling was also installed, as well as the necessary equipment for automatic train operation. In July 1993, the new and improved Waterloo and City Line opened to the public. But the following year, it would undergo another radical change. For a long time now, the Waterloo and City had been an oddity, an underground line in all but name. With the overhaul, the only real difference between it and any other tube line was its ownership. In the 1990s, the government made the controversial decision to privatise British Rail, and the opportunity was taken to bring a little logic to proceedings. So on the 1st of April 1994, London Transport bought the Waterloo and City line from British Rail for the nominal sum of one pound. Try getting anywhere on the tube for a pound these days. At last, the Waterloo and City line was officially an underground line. Well, hmm, kind of. Operationally, it's considered part of the central line. It makes a lot of sense. It uses the same trains, and it has interchange with the central line at Bank. Waterloo Depot is a subshed of Hainault Depot. The line would be rebranded. Trains would be painted in the familiar red, white, and blue of London Underground, and roundels would appear on station platforms. It would be depicted on maps in a sort of aqua colour. In March 2020, the line was closed altogether due to the pandemic, the only line to completely shut down. It would remain closed until July 2021, though since then it has been entirely closed at weekends, with Transport for London arguing that the decreased demand means that it's not worth opening on Saturdays either. So, once again, the line is the odd one out. One upside of the weekend closures is that it's the only operational part of the underground that can be used for filming, although if you're a tube nerd, it's way too distinctive to pass for any other line. Still, oddity or not, closed or not, the little line just keeps on going. I've heard people ask what the point of such a short and often little used line is, yet the demand to keep it going is still there. 125 years later, and 175 years since the LSWR first opened their station at Waterloo. So, happy birthday to the Waterloo and City Line. Long may you trundle on. Well, I hope you enjoyed this draining tale from the tube. It's rather longer than usual, but I wanted to do justice to the subject matter. My biggest source for this has been one book, The Waterloo and City Railway, by John C. Gillam, which I would recommend if you'd like to go into even more depth. I would like, as ever, to thank my donors on Ko-fi, Patreon, and here on YouTube for your generous support. You are the second cab to my motorcoach. And I'll see you all again very soon for another Tale from the Tube.